afternoon. My name is Stephen Connor. I am the director of Central Hampshire Veterans Services. And today we are starting our first monthly show. Unfortunately, I don't have a name for it, but it's always going to be around veterans issues. If you have any good ideas, contact my office if you have a good idea for the show or contact NorthamptonTV.org and maybe they can help us out get a name for our show. We're planning on having it aired uh, before or after our state show, which is Sound Off. Sound Off is being produced um, through Newton Television, and it has to do with the state issues that veterans face in Massachusetts. Currently, I am finishing up my year as president of the Massachusetts Veterans Service Officers Association, uh, which produces that show. And I now have, for a couple of years, really wanted to have our own local version of that show to address the needs of veterans locally and what we provide and what can be happening and just what's happening with veterans today. So welcome. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our new program that's going to be happening. It's going to be an annual event. It's called the Small Town Veterans Expo. This year it's going to be taking place at the Cummington Fairgrounds in Cummington, Massachusetts on May 10th and 11th. It's a Friday and a Saturday. The reason for the two days, we figure on a Friday, lots of younger folks will be working, veterans who are employed, but those that are uh, retired, who want to know about all the things that veterans can get, whether it's VA funding, whether it's the VA hospital, the Hoyoke Soldiers Home, that's going to be a big focus of that day. Then on uh, Saturday, we are starting off the Expo Day by having a veterans, um, a returning OIF OEF veteran um, convoy, a welcome home, welcome home convoy. And it's going to go right through our district. Uh, for those folks that don't know about our district, we start in Pelham and we end in Cummington. Ten towns incomplete. We start with Pelham, Amherst, Hadley, Northampton, Williamsburg, Chesterfield, Goshen, Cummington, Worthington, and Middlefield. Those are the communities that make up uh, Central Hampshire Veterans Services. We are doing our best to get through seven of those communities with our convoy that will end at the Cummington Fairgrounds by noon and it will be followed by a short ceremony uh, acknowledging the services of our men and women from not only these conflicts but all conflicts and we expect a lot of people um, from both the legislature and local people and we've been promised by the adjutant general he will be there uh, on Saturday so um, if you're a veteran and you're in one of these communities, or even any community, we don't care. We're putting it out into the Berkshires, into Western Franklin County, all of Franklin County, as a matter of fact. And so it's, it's kind of a Western Mass deal, but it, it's going to be taking place in Cummington. So with that in mind, I thought, how do I get the word out to folks? And we're doing some uh, advertising and some publicity but I thought this would be a great time to have our first show. And what I wanted to do with that was kind of talk about what happens with a veteran. I remember when I came home, uh, I was a U.S. Navy, I was, an, I was a sailor, and there was a lot I didn't know about. I've heard that a lot. And so what I thought was is I would bring a returning veteran from these conflicts, um, actually the Iraq War, uh, on as a guest, and we would just talk about the things that veterans go through, service members when they return, when they get discharged, things like that, and just their experience. So I have invited uh, Jeremiah Mika to be my first guest on my doing? show. Um, welcome, Jeremiah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess the first thing I would like to do is um, if you would please just tell us a little bit about you know, where you're from and what branch of the service you served yep. in. So uh, I'm <clears throat> actually from Northampton, Mass. So I was born and raised here. Um, I joined the military in 2000. 
Uh, at that point, I... Oh, before 9-11. Yeah, before 9-11, joined. Uh, it was a th uh, three-year contract. Uh, joined that, ended up going to airborne school, went to the 82nd Airborne for a year. Uh, then I went to South Korea for another year. Uh, at that point, I got out, started to go uh, to college and stuff. Um, and then uh, about, I guess, another year and a half later, um, I, uh, they called me back into the service through the uh, inactive ready reserve. And then I spent another year and a half, and that's when I was down in Mississippi, actually, when Hurricane Katrina was going on. And then uh, got shipped over to Iraq for a year, well, about nine, ten months. Um, so uh, back in Northampton, uh, like I said, I was born and raised from a big family, third generation. Uh, I have no plans in leaving. Just enjoy the town. It's a great place to live, and uh, that's kind of where I'm at. Oh, very good, very yeah. good. Um, well, so I guess it'll be an interesting perspective because you were in, and then you came back, and then you got called back again. Yep. So what I was wondering is, is what did it? There was times you were on leave. Um, what did it feel like when you came home on leave and you'd be here for a week, two weeks? Well, I mean, first thing, you're always excited uh, to be back home with your family, see all your friends. Um, it's always kind of a blur, you know, you, you land, <laughs> you see everybody, and then the next thing you know, you're taking off and you're like, yeah. well, that... That went really that fast. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what happened there? Um, yeah. But it was, it was always an exciting time because you got to uh, get away from the set schedule and running every day and you know those types of things and it, it's good to see everybody and really kind of put things together um, and really take some downtime and, and just really really uh, reconnect with family and friends it was always always a happy time to come home always always All right. yep um, when you were overseas now so you you were in you came back um, when you were overseas, did they ever extend your time? Because I know they had done that with people for the stop loss. Right, yeah, the stop loss. So <clears throat> it was kind of weird how it worked. Um, so we came out of the inactive ready reserve, and it's for a 18-month uh, period. And when we were over there, there was a lot of questions. There was about 22 of us in that unit. Uh, we were assigned to a National Guard unit out of Iowa. Um, out of we Iowa. Out of Iowa. And, mm -hmm. uh, Iowa and Minnesota, actually, but um, when we were there, there's only 22 out of 1,800 people in our battalion, and we're starting to say, okay, well, are we getting out on the date that our contract for the 18 months is up, or because we're in Iraq, are we stuck here? Right. Um, well, we left on our contract date, which we didn't think was going to happen, uh, flying home, and then we start getting emails about a week and a half later that they stop lost the group that was there for another six or three months or six months. Right, yeah. um, so at that point, we were kind of like, if we were there, we might have got stop loss. So we're right. really happy that we missed that by the one week. Also, sadly, that you know you kind of you don't want to leave people behind and leave something somebody stranded. So you kind of felt like you're missing your team in a, in a lot of ways. But it's also really nice to get home uh, a little bit early from that. So that's kind of yeah. that's how that happened. Yep. Oh, all right. Um, did, um, can you tell us a little bit about the process of coming home when you finally did come home? I mean, you came home from Iraq. How long after you got back did you then get a discharge? Uh, so, let's see, it was probably, it was right before Christmas. And, oh, uh, there you go. Yeah, it was Talk probably, hectic, yeah. It was probably one of the most, uh, it, you know, it was kind of frustrating because if they, we missed a flight by a day and we probably would have been home for Christmas. So we missed that, so we ended up waiting for another uh, week or so. Then we flew back, and I want to say we went to, oh, it was outside of Minnesota. And it was just a very random old World War II base. I mean, really, it was like, and there's only 22 of us that flew out, only 22 right. of us there. And we spent about four or five days out processing. You have a really long tr you know, checklist, and you run from station to station. and. Um, anybody who's gone through it, all the veterans know how frustrating you're like, which one's going to be done first and sit in lines for days and dental and medical. So we got through that process. You wait for your plane tickets. Um, they calculate out your leave time uh, that you have left. You get paid for that while you're home. So your actual discharge takes place when you're at home about maybe it's two weeks that you had built up or something like that. Um, so that was the case. I think I actually was home 
just after the first of the year, but I was actually discharged maybe the 15th or 17th of January in 08. So, okay. yep. yeah, so, um, you know, I, for me, I had participated with the, um, the Guard has yellow ribbon uh, events that they call them here in Massachusetts. And they have pre-deployment, family mid-deployment, and post-deployment events. And they'll happen at um, various hotels. I know they had one um, at one of the big hotels in Springfield that I had gone to. And it is like almost like stations, but it's not being discharged and there's medical and this, that, and the other thing. Right. But it's more of, this is what you could do. These are options for you. This is, yep. this is out there. And you can go around and you can collect all the stuff going on. Um, when they did it, and I was working with them, they discovered that when they did it when they first got home, everybody went, uh-huh, 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 picked up papers, picked up forms, yep. and, uh, you know, went out, and then if somebody asked them, and I would even be the one, well, didn't you get told this? Right. I don't know what I was told. So yeah. when you were going through that process, how much of your mind was on the process, and how much was, I want to get home, it's... The yeah. holidays, it's my, oh, absolutely. who's there, you know. Yeah, no, it was uh, the fastest, the absolute fastest way you could get home was the, was the route you took. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was like, right. you know, you'd almost hide an injury because the last thing you want to do is get stuck in medical for another six months in some random base. So it was like, just Especially get in me Minnesota, through this. that was where we're yeah. yeah, and I think <laughs> it was a battle for the people who were trying to help you in the discharge process. You don't want to be there. You're kind of like as fast as possible. They recognize that, and they say, okay, let's push them through and help them get out of here as fast as possible. And you probably miss a lot of information. Um, I mean, the packets and the paperwork stacks. I have a filing cabinet dedicated to just military documents and paperwork, and probably know maybe a tenth of what any one of those papers really stand for. So I think right. it's, a, it's a pretty big battle. I don't think the information in my eyes gets out. Right. I, there's still probably a lot of benefits that I, I don't realize that are out there. Um, anytime that you hear They're free money. They're probably in drawer. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you hear free yeah. money, um, right. you might go for that. It's an easier one. You never forget it. Somebody will tip you off to it. But when it's not that, it starts to turn into... Um, you know, educational benefits. I did use my GI Bill. Um, yeah, I was going to ask, but you, you yep. went to school with the GI Bill. I did go to school with the GI Bill, yep. And that was great because I had the opportunity of having him work in my office yep, yep. as, uh, as a uh, work-study student. Um, those that are on the GI Bill, the VA will pay for them to help out other veterans. So um, you use that. Have you used any of the other? I haven't. Um, I do know a lot of, uh, not a lot, I know a little bit about the housing program. Um, right. I realize that you're allowed to use it twice in your lifetime, uh, so I think I'm, I'm trying to use it at the right moments. If uh, I can use a first-time home buyers, for instance, might right. be a better route for me right now. But if I can get a better rate later on in life, I'll definitely do that. Uh, the small business benefits, um, things on in in that arena, I they're very. It's very hard to decipher. It's very hard to, and I think not just on my end, but banks and things like that don't understand them. Right. So whenever you mention a program or you talk about a program or something like that, they, they don't know. I think it's more about educating the other uh, institutions to have a better understanding of what veterans really are entitled to and not entitled right. to. Um, right. Yeah, I think well, you know, on that one of the things also you're talking about, you know, just wanting to get home and hiding injuries and stuff. I have World War II and Korean War yeah. veterans who said, well, no, I didn't report anything. And I'm like, yeah. why? Because it was time to go home. I wasn't going to, you yeah. know, tell anybody then because they were going to keep me. And I'd be like, yeah, I understand that. But now you come with the problem and it's not gotten so yeah. bad that it's 40 years later. And it's hard when you haven't reported it. But right. I understood it. And we usually win the cases, but they're, they're usually longer because. Oh, okay. But I, you can't blame anybody for, you know, you've been gone from home, yep. loved ones, girlfriends, boyfriends, whatever for a long time, yep. it's the last thing you want to think about. So, well, the, the yellow ribbon um, events that they had, they usually did it like three months after people got home. And I think that helped some by um, giving them a weekend, really starting to learn. Um, but uh, there was another question I had. Um, oh, 
There we go. Um, are you still close to anybody that you served with? Well, you said that 22 of you came back, 21 of you came back uh, from your unit? Yep, well, there was, so they weren't really, it was just out of the inactive ready reserve. Um, right. So they're a very tight-knit group, uh, the way it worked. Well, there's two scenarios. There's two groups of people that, you know, obviously my first three years, um, you know, and then being in South Korea and stuff, uh, there's a lot of people that I still am in contact with. I have yeah, two Korean gonna, nationals yeah. that used to work with us, and I, we talk on Facebook uh, once every couple of months or whatever. I know what's going on in their lives, and oh, cool. would love to get back there and see them. Uh, it was one of my favorite places. But as there's long that as group North of people. Korea starts behaving themselves. Right, right, right. right, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need to go to another no, war. No, no, <laughs> not into that. Um, but there's that group of people, and I keep in touch with them quite often. Uh, Facebook is a, probably the biggest asset to that. Um, but then there's the, the Iraq group, and there's a lot of guys that you got really close with, obviously. I was closer with the um, inactive ready reserve group. Like I said, we were the only ones that did. Most of us had our at least active duty period. So the amount of days that we spent, you know, running and being in uniform and that probably equated to somebody who was in 15 years in the National Guard. Right. So although they were older and they had the rank because it was the time frame, we had more experience. So when it came to even calling cadences and things like that, I mean, we were proficient at it. We had to do it every single day. Yeah. Where right. they had to do it one weekend a month, two weeks right. out of the year. So they're like, they know a couple here and there. So right. it ended up being where you always were in those those spots and those positions. So we always got, uh, you know, we, with the experience and things, we ended up, we were convoy uh, security and we were always the IED sweep teams and things. So we were always the guys that left early and always had, a, it seemed like a little bit more inherent risk um, mm -hmm. just because we had more experience. And rightfully so, I think probably, mm -hmm. you know, more people could have been hurt if it wasn't that case. I, right, you, right. You don't know because you can't tell the future. Right. But um, but I keep uh, I keep in touch with a lot of them, a yeah. lot of guys. I, I would guess. imagine, you know, that I mean, yep. that's what everybody says. And every veteran that I've talked to when they've come home, it's like the people that they were in harm's way with, uh, that they really had to rely on back and forth. You know, back home, you probably would have said, I wouldn't even be friends with them in high school, but under those circumstances, under that situation, oh, yeah. you know, they have your back, you have theirs, and it yep. creates a bond that you just don't get anywhere else. Yeah. So. Well, it was funny, uh, myself and a driver, uh, while we were over in Iraq, we took an IED, and he calls me on that day. It's like June 10th calls me every June 10th. Yeah. Hey, I just want to let you know I'm happy we're alive. Yeah. <laughs> hey, good to hear from yeah. you. How's yeah. life? You know, no big deal. Just kind of chatted up for a little yeah. bit, but we always just laughed about that. We, yeah, we'll call each other every June 10th. So it's been, I don't know, six, seven years now and he calls me still June 10th. And <laughs> People on the outside chat. probably are like, wow, that's a weird thing to like celebrate, yeah. but it's oh, not. Absolutely. It's, yeah, it's, yeah it's, celebrating life is good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll throw it out there. <laughs> um, now, one of the things, uh, the, the comparisons, is when people came back from World War II, uh, even Korea, lots of them, like my uncles and stuff, they came back on a ship, you know. Uh, it took them weeks to get home. Yep. Then they had to go get processed Process, out. Yeah. And they got to just hang out and kind of debrief informally amongst themselves. Right. And nowadays, it seems like you get home, and you could be, you know, on duty somewhere, oh, and yeah. within a week, you're home, or even less for some people, especially for those who go home on leave. It's a matter of days. Yep. Uh, it's just kind of a weird sensation. It's uh, so a little story. So you wear all your battle equipment, front plates, back plates, arm plates, um, side plates, everything. It's around 150 pounds, you know, when you're all said and done is strapped to you. Weapons, Kevlar, whole nine yards. So here I am. It's like, all right, hey, you guys are flying out in five days. I've had this thing on for, for a year and a half. <laughs> year and a half. No joke. Yeah. Yeah. The most annoying thing you could, I mean, it's who wants to carry around a 150 pound monkey on their back, right. you know? Right. So we get done uh, doing the first part of the out processing. We walk through a warehouse. We turn it all in. I walk out, I'm never going to put that on again. There's no ceremony, yeah. <laughs> there's no <laughs> anything else. It was just, 
Wait, we just turn it in, and that's it, that's and it. that was it. This was like my protection <laughs> there was and the biggest the big, pain. And I that was it. I turn yeah. it in, and then I'm like, wow. So like tomorrow, I don't ever, I'll never wear it again. I've never, I don't even know if I've seen a Kevlar ever again. <laughs> and it was like, oh, I'm sure no big somebody deal. in the audience tomorrow, has some. They'll probably drop <laughs> yeah. it off so you can wear it. <laughs> it was just kind of like, wow, you know. And it was like, and then, you know, and then you're going through the rest of the process, and you know, 14, 15 days later, you're out. Mm -hmm. knowing that you're never going back in you were already called back once and it was it's kind of surreal you yeah. know and uh then there's the transition obviously the transition home and you know getting back with your friends and family and all the dynamics and things that changed there but it was right. uh yeah it was that was one of the funniest things because i walked out I'm like can you believe that just happened? <laughs> like, that's it. That was a monumental. <laughs> like you never have to carry. I know. Just, I never yeah. have to carry that. Again. I didn't even hear music for <laughs> yeah. that or anything. <laughs> like a yeah. handshake or something. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Couldn't even buy my buddy a beer. I think we were still in Kuwait. So. Oh geez. <laughs> um, now you were talking about Facebook, and, and it's different today. But when when my parents and you know my father and my uncles and everybody they came back, they joined the VFWs and the American Legions and. You know, there's always, I've always heard generation after generation, you know, the um, World War II Club, uh, now the Veterans Association of Hampshire County, but the World War II Club in Northampton began because they felt like they were dissed by the, um, either the American Legion or the VFW. One of those groups said, oh, you're not a real veteran, you're a World War II. You know, right. which you sit there and go, but it's happened to many, many generations, and we all know what happened to the Vietnam vet. Right. And so they started the VVA, and they have integrated into other um, right. clubs and associations and stuff. The OIF OEF vets um, coming back, you don't really see them organizing that way. Do you belong to any uh, club? Uh, do you find, you know, a need for it for the camaraderie or to get a voice or do you have other ways of doing it is there online I mean yeah I mean you say uh, Facebook but right you know. right I mean obviously Facebook's the easiest quickest contact um, I do belong to uh, the Legion uh, and VFW but I found it uh, incredibly frustrating at first when mm -hmm. I came back uh, you know some my uncle brought me to the VFW and oh it pays for your uh, membership you know mm -hmm. people buy you a beer and you know it's kind of cool it's it's neat and then the next thing you know uh, you know the vice president wants you to uh, start participating and running it because they want the young blood right right and I get it and I understand it but it was like I don't, that's it's too much right now yeah. I'm not ready to run yeah. your organization that's in right. HAMP or wherever it is um, so I started you know, almost step back from it um, right. but I still think I think they're important. I think being part of it is great. I think the Legion has awesome benefits. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that they do for us. Um, uh, you know, anybody who's not a member should be. Uh, right. But also, you go to these places, most of the places, I mean, the World War II Club's a little bit different now. They've morphed into something else. But as far as for a young crowd or a young uh, veteran coming back, it offers a place to just drink. Right. And, you know, yeah, military people like to drink, but you also want to do other things. Right. It's really just centralized around drinking. I think it needs to evolve mm -hmm. into what really matters to us right. now. And I think, you know, just being healthy and outdoors and enjoying life and, mm -hmm. you know, and do the things that aren't going to be a depressant and be more of a positive outlook. Right. That's that's kind of my view on it. Um, right. And you don't, yeah, it doesn't fair. And I, I've heard it a lot. Uh, have you joined or ever looked on to IAVA, the Iraq Afghanistan Veterans Association. I have not. Yeah, I have not. See, I I became a member as not a full member, but as a um, um, I forgot what they even called it, but it allows me to get their emails like every week, and yep. they organize and they'll go to Capitol Hill, they'll go outside yep. the White House, they go as a unit, but they do it all online, right. and you sign petitions, and then they'll organize and say, everybody show up in D.C. or everybody yeah. show up in New York and stuff like that. So yeah. it's kind of what those clubs used to be. And, yeah, I, I think the family or the, the young activities have come out of those clubs only because there's not been a lot of young people joining. Right. Them. And you have the older ones who are, yep. you know, they're dedicated, they're working really hard, but they're also looking for the new generations to yep. do it. 
No, I agree. And, and there was some difficulty with the Vietnam vet, and they started yeah. their own VVA. But think about it, even the Vietnam vets are late 50s, early 60s at oh. the youngest, and yeah. some even older. So Yeah, and then yeah. there's always that kind of respect uh, portion. You know, I mean, they've, mm -hmm. their, their wars were different than our wars, for sure. I mean, they... You know, I have each the one utmost of them respect, yeah, yeah. All, and, all, and all of them were, and I, yeah. you know, you have the utmost respect, but then sometimes they just start going on this rant about something, and you're lost. Yeah. You're yeah. like, whoa, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's not how it is these days. You know, things yeah. are different. So, um, you know, I, and it sucks because I was, I went a few times. I went a few times. I was trying to be positive, but I would never want to bring my wife there. Right. I wouldn't want to sit down and at the VFW bar and right. and try to think that I was going to have a great time. I mean, right. I'd like to chat, but I don't think it would, <laughs> you know. Right. That anyway. right. It wouldn't be your special wife. Yeah. Yeah, I understand that. Um, so uh, we have the convoy um, coming up, and we are um, hoping that you might be on one of our vehicles. Again, it's going to be a lot of vehicles uh, police, fire, and one of the things that I found looking for returning veterans from these conflicts, turns out it's really easy to find a bunch of them because they all work for the fire department, <laughs> police department, <laughs> correctional officers, yeah. you know, they are about duty and about serving. Yeah. They served over there, so they served back home. Yeah. Um, you serve something else, but you know, yeah, there yeah. you go. <laughs> But um, so exactly what's going to be at the expo? It's um, all right. The expo, what we're hoping. Uh, well, I do know that we're having a ceremony there on that Saturday, but there are going to be different units within the VA are going to be there. Everything from, you know, the hearing clinic, I think, is going to be there to primary care to meet the needs of all the veterans coming home. I know that the OIF OEF case management is going to be there. They're going to have a table. So it's going to be a bunch of tables um, outside and then a building inside that are just going to have the VA. Uh, we're having some banks there that are going to talk about home loans. Yep. There are, um, I'm trying to think off of the top of my head, banks. Oh, the Hoyo Soldiers Home uh, for folks who want to ask questions and they say, oh, I can wait, I can wait, and then all of a sudden, something goes wrong yeah, they and they want to go in and it's a year-long wait yeah you know so we want to have those kind of places there but also um, colleges and some of the um, colleges are going to be there what they offer veterans Perfect. if you go to that college and then all the different programs the educational programs scholarships things like that that's what's going to be at the event yeah. so we've got it for every generation and uh, so it should be a good time and perfect I know you said you were gonna be there so we look forward to you being there oh, absolutely. it's at the Cummington Fairgrounds um, so thank you very yeah, much absolutely Thanks for coming for on my first show perfect. and helping me christen it mm -hmm. and uh, I appreciate it and thank you for sharing your experiences with our audience Absolutely. and uh, thank you everybody welcome to our first show and we plan to run this as a monthly program if you have issues that you want covered or things that you can think about, just let us know and we'd, uh, we'll, we'll try to get it on the agenda. Thank you very much.